All right, here with Jeff Willis, ABCA Hall of Famer, uh, seven NJCA championships, tied for the NJCA record for most national championships in one sport. Also, a former Skip Bertman Award winner. So, Jeffrey, thanks for jumping on with me again. I appreciate it, man. It's always a pleasure to be with you, Ryan. And um, we go back a long way. And, um, you know, I can't say enough. And it's just a privilege and pleasure to be with you guys today. What's more important to you, going into the Hall of Fame or being our first uh, third time guest on the ABCA podcast? <laughs> well, if you would, I would never even dreamt that 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 would be taking place. Me going into a Hall of Fame, let alone, you know, just growing up being on the podcast um, with you guys, you know, for for how many ever times it is, it's just uh, I, I could have never predicted that. Predicted this, predicted it. Um, I've just been very, very lucky to be around incredible individuals um, from when I was younger all the way through through today, um, from co past coaches to players and athletes to assistant coaches to administrators at our institution and people that have believed in me and given me an opportunity. And I can't I can't say enough of how thankful I am um, for those opportunities that I've been given. And you have a lot left in the tank. I mean, is it is it interesting for you that you are going in the Hall of Fame, even though you're you're probably at the middle of your career right now? Well, when I when I got the phone call and and they they said you know you've been selected to do this, I I, I actually my first reaction was, well, do you know how old I am? Um, I know I, maybe I look a lot older than I am, um, but again, I mean, I, I it just, I, I you you can't ex you can't describe the emotion that's in that because. If I look at that Hall of Fame class that's going in, those are people that I have looked up to. Those are coaches that I wanted to play for at one time. Those were coaches that that I aspired to be. And and uh, I'm gonna be a, a kid in the candy store that night of that induction um, as a fan, as someone that's gonna be in, in the audience. And and I don't I don't look at myself as an equal in that. I mean, those are guys that I've learned off of and, and benefited from things that they've done in the game um, and, and tried to emulate the things that they've done in our own program here. And just again, it's just a privilege and, and you can't put into words to describe the emotion of, of 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 that phone call that was made. Because you only get like three to five minutes. So who are some specific like shout outs that you want to give that you may not be able to get into in your speech? Well, I, I mean, I, I've been thinking about that. I, you don't ever want to leave anybody out. And about the time you start to do that, you leave somebody out. Um, but I mean, I can go back all the way from when I was young. You, know, you always start with your parents. I mean, those individuals, but even coaches growing up and all the different sports that I played growing up. Um, high school baseball coach was was tremendous. One of the best individuals I've ever been around. Um you know, to, to your dad, um, you know, he was my first college coach. And and then I went and played it for Russell Stockton, which he's Bragg Stockton's son. Um, and then, you know, I, I, you know, played for Brian Reese at University of Arkansas Little Rock and, and then just the opportunities I've been given. And then my institution that took a shot on a 24 year old, um, they don't do that. They don't do that. And I got lucky. And when I became the athletic director two years after that, you know, they hired me when I was 24 and, I became the AD at 26 and I got the search folder of when they hired me as a baseball coach and opened it up. I said, they didn't know what they were doing um, because there was a lot more qualified names on that list than me. Um, but somebody believed in me at that point. Um, somebody at this institution that I've, that I've been at believed in me. And we had a blank canvas for the most part when, 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 when we got here and, and we were able to paint that canvas and um, hasn't been easy. And, and, uh, I always kind of get frustrated when I hear coaches that say that they don't have this or they don't have that. My first reaction is that you don't want it bad enough. If, if you wanted it bad enough, you'd figure out a way to get it done. And, um, you'd figure out a way to, to raise the money to get it done because we raised our first scholarships. We raised our coaches salary. We still do some of that today. Um, we raise our mill. We, we do a lot of things that a lot of people assume with the success that we've been a part of the things have just been, we we're still having to do those things. And, it's just a reminder to the late Tony Robichaux over at UL Lafayette and him and I would have conversations and, you know, nobody really knew it, but he, he was raising their operating budget over there and, you know, the school gave him his scholarships and gave him his coaches salaries. Then he was raising all that operating budget. And so um, it's just, just got put into a position young, um, wanted to work hard and wanted to have an impact on young people around. And, and, and because of that, it was the people that came before me, with the coaches and mentors and administrators that that have been um that that gave me those opportunities
Is it a loyalty thing for you? I mean, you kind of built the program there. Is it a loyalty thing for you because you have stayed there that long? Well, I think it's, you know, I think people always are looking for, you know, the grass is greener on the other side and they never realize that there's grass sitting right in front of them. If they just water it and throw some fertilizer on it, it's just, it might be as green. And I've always, I heard a long time ago, I don't know who said it, but I heard someone say, make the job you're currently at your dream job and, and work towards that. And, you know, I would have never, ever thought or even predicted that we would be a part of the championships that we've been a part of. Um, and and it's been exciting to see the excitement on the kid's face when that takes place. But that doesn't define who we are. Um, you know, everyone wants to fi- define themselves or divide, define their teams based on what their outcomes were when they should be defining themselves and defining their teams based on what their process was. And, you know, we're, we're all in this journey of, of trying to build something, whether it's our own life or whether it's young people's life that we're coaching or mentoring or we run a company or we run or CEO somewhere. We're all trying to build something. And a lot of times we jump to the outcome of what that looks like. And little do we know that the entire time during the process, we were constantly building that house and our house is our life. Our house is, is what we're trying to accomplish um, but that house started being built back when I was a child. And so it, it's it's never a person that made that happen. Um, and and the motivation is always got to be something different than yourself. It's got to be the people that are around you um, and who they're going to become later on in life. And I always say we'll define the success of our teams, not based on if we went on that scoreboard. We'll define that um, based on when those young people become leaders in their own family, husbands and fathers, and what are they doing with their kids? And um, it's exciting to see all the past players that are coaching now and, and that coaching tree that's out there. And, you know, we, we got over 50 past players in our state that are coaching. And it's exciting to kind of see that all kind of go and, and the transformation. And everyone that was a part of my journey has a part in that as well. It's all interconnected and it all makes a difference in everybody's lives that, that, that come across yourself or me and, and you and I were teammates. And, and, you know, I think you've heard me say this before and I, I've said it to many people, you know, the, the one of the best teammates I have, if not the best was, was you. And, you know, you were an upperclassman. I was an underclassman. You took the young people underneath your arm um, and you showed what it looked like to be a servant and the servanthood that actually took. And, um, you were taught that by by your parents and by other people that are around you. And we all strive to be like that every single day. You know, we've done a lot of youth stuff here in the last, you know, 10, 11 days. And I try to talk to the youth coaches. So who are some of your most impactful youth coaches? Because I think that's why we all continued to play the sport that we were in, because we had impactful mm-hmm. youth coaches. With, without a doubt. I mean, I can, I, I can remember my youth coach, the best one I had. Um, and he didn't know much about baseball, but but he knew about people. And he knew how to treat people and how to motivate people. Um, but also remember the worst one that I had when I was six years old and the person, you know, almost drove me out of baseball at, at that point. And, you know, being the worst player on the team my first year in T-ball to and this guy almost weeds me out of that to it actually burned a fire in me and motivated me to be better. Um, and I remember my parents looking at me and saying, you can either choose to 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 change the path right now. Or you can quit and, and run from it. And uh, I mean, that happened at six years old. And 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 I remember that individual. I can still remember the things that were said to me. Um, and it motivated me. It may not motivate the other person because they they may take that differently. And, and that's why our youth coaches are are the biggest asset of, of uh, you know, there's a big concern of, of why we're having tryouts for select teams at six years old and seven years old. Why, what, what are we doing? Why are we doing those things? And Let's go play. Like, I don't think you need to te- teach competition. Everybody likes to win. You know, I know there's a difference between liking li- liking to win versus hating to lose. There's a difference in that. But let- let's teach the game. Let's let's teach how to have fun. Let's not try to weed people out at younger ages because they may physically mature later on and become the best players that are out there. I mean, do you think that's separated with the people that actually are successful? Is they're way more resilient uh, with life setbacks than other people are. Yeah, I, I don't think that they um, they don't see those as setbacks. They 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 see those as setups. Um, they they look at that and say, whoa, 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 whoa that 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 was just a wake up call. 
that that that's that's not the end of the world. The sun's going to come up as long as I got breath in my lungs. I can change and make a difference and move move that setback or that hardship or adversity and overcome that. And it and it's just like you know, it's just like you go in the weight room. Like you have to tear down your muscles in order to build them up. It's the same thing in life. If you don't if you don't get torn down at times and you don't face adversity, you don't get knocked down. How are you going to continue to have a growth mindset? How are you going to move to the next level, the step up that you actually need to take? And a lot of people want to frown or, or run from adversity, run towards it, run, run towards it and, and embrace it and say, I'm going to get stronger through this. Um, and if it doesn't kill me, it's only going to make me better. How's the stadium project coming? It's it's coming. It, we're excited. We'll review the final construction documents um, uh, right after Thanksgiving, um, and then it'll go out on bid, and then we'll rock and roll through it. So, yeah, how has that, that process been, been for somebody that's never gone process. through it? How it's it's been lengthy, correct? It's a long process, and and I think coaches sometimes all of, all of us coaches want to hear now. We want it done now, and and that's how we are. I mean, we operate with if we don't get this done or we don't get that done, then sometimes we feel at the end of the day, we, we failed and not realizing there's a whole process of, of uh, how to get something like that accomplished. And I think we're on two years now, two and a half years. Well, ever since the summer of 2021 and, you know, we're two years down, two and a half years down the road right now. Um, and it's just been a process, but we've had tremendous support from our state leaders and, and our local constituents and, um, with getting on board with, with the vision of what we want to do. Um, we want it to be transformational, not in a baseball sense, but for a community sense um, of get people out to the ballpark, having a multi-use facility that you could have concerts in and things of that nature, but also have the best facility in junior college baseball. And, and we're excited. We're going to do that. We're going to do it. And it's going to be exciting. And um, I would have never, you know, you, you did go back 20 years. I would have never even dreamt this kind of stuff. It's just, I'm not a goal setter. And, and, and I think sometimes goal setters are people that they limit themselves. Um, and, and a goal setting mindset is actually outcome based. Get away from the outcomes. And if it becomes a mission based um, thought process of this is your mission. And, and I tell our young people all the time, and, and I don't always do this. I'm guilty of not living up to that. Um, but wake up with some sense of excellence that the first thing you do in the morning if it's brush your teeth, brush your teeth with a sense of excellence and then make the next choice and the next choice and the next choice. Um, and then try to live your life like that. You're not going to be perfect. You're going to screw up and you're going to say things. You're going to do things. You're, you're, you're not going to live up to to what you're trying to to aspire to be. Um, but that's also life. You know, those are the setbacks. And sometimes we make bad choices. Sometimes we make that bad decisions. And sometimes we handle a situation the wrong way. Um, but if your heart po posture is, I'm trying to be the best selfless version of myself, not best version, but most selfless version of myself. And that is your process. And that is your mission. Um, you don't have goals that are a part of that because I think sometimes people set goals and it limits them. It, it lowers their ceiling when they do that because they never know what they could have. I thought we we had would have a chance to win a national championship. I would have never thought we would want seven. You know, I would have never dreamt that and never thought that. But if our goal was just to win a national championship or something in that regard, which we've never talked about here, but if that would have been a goal, I think people would have just done that and then they'd been satisfied instead of saying that's not the mission, that's not the goal, um, and get the goal thought process out of their mind. I had goals like goals in their post fall review of themselves just to see what they would come back with so we could talk about it because obviously a lot of it was going to be stat driven. And I wanted to get them away from focusing on stats out of their control. So, like, I put that in there just as where I could kind of see where their process was going into the season. It's like, hey, yeah, that's fine, but how are you going to get there? You know, so so reframe that as, as the journey piece, how you're going to get there rather than focusing on stuff that's out of your control. Without, without a doubt. I mean, it's the old thought process, how do you eat the elephant? It's one bite at a time. You can't skip steps. There's no shortcuts. There's no secret recipe. Well, there is a secret recipe. It, it comes down to your work ethic and your attitude um, and, and those things. And, and people seem to think there's a, another piece of that puzzle. And, and there's really not. Is the auto bid going to get done for NJCA Division Two? 
Is yeah, that it's open? done. Yeah, it, okay, it's good. done. It'll, it'll be in, it, it's in play for this spring. And, and that was a big, big thing that we wanted to have done. And, you know, we've got it. We've got one auto bid in the division three ranks. We've got two now in the division two. And now we need to get some in the v division one. I mean, when, when you're looking at trying to get the best teams to those national tournaments and, and you have to geographically play because nobody has the money to, to go across country at the two year level and do that. There should be some of those at large positions to get the best teams there. And it should be every national tournament's goal to get the best teams there and let them play. Um, and we realize there's ge geographically, there's decisions that have to be made um, with that because we have to, as administrator, we have to think about the finances and how much money we're spending um, as well. But, but again, we want teams at national, I do, I want teams at national tournament that have, have a chance to win the last game, not to go in there and go 0-2 or one and two, we, we want the best teams there for those kids to experience um, because they do have the best teams and those coaches get to experience that as well. And you're taking a team to honk ball again? I, I, I'm i not taking the team in, in any sense. Um, I'm the administrator on the trip, um, being the Coaches Association president. Um, we've got three coaches that we've named, um, Marty Smith at Central Florida, Mike Davenport at Madison, and then Rob Valley at, at uh, Gloucester. That's a good crew. Yeah, we're excited about that. That's a good crew. Uh, yeah, when I put that when I put that group together, I, I was really excited. I wanted, you know, Marty's been around a long time, won the national championship last year. You know, Mike has been around a long time as well, had success every single year, and so has Rob. And so you're looking for individuals who who some they may not won the last game of the year, but but you shouldn't define your success by that. They've put together a career of being successful every single year, and let's let them coach the team and put it together and. I'm kind of handling the logistics behind the scene and and with some other individuals as well um, about the trip and and uh, I'll go over with them and and be a part of it. Um, I'll throw some VP. I'll hit some bungos if it's needed. Um, but I'm looking forward to kind of seeing those coaches work. And um, I did that back in 2010 with you know, my coaching staff was Mark Reardon, who's now at Western Kentucky. He was at Iowa Western, and and then I had John Stratton was also on that staff from Arizona Western, and it was just an honor to be able to put you know your flag on your sleeve and the USA across your chest and go into inter international baseball competition and represent the country. And I'm excited for those coaches and then even more excited for the players to, to get to go do that as well. What have you enjoyed about being the ABCA and JCA chair? I, I think it's, it's just the group of people that are in that room um, from, from, from the executive group at the ABCA from Craig and John and, um, yourself and and Jr. and Matt and um, you know all you know Juan all those guys at that level and I may be forgetting somebody right now and I don't hope I'm not but but all those guys at that level and just the the heart that they have to make the game better um, and then the guys that are a part of those committees that are the coaches across our country and and see how much they care about um, the game and how they're trying to make it better and um, you see guys put their egos aside. You see guys put their, their own self-interest aside for the betterment of our game. And, and, and I, we're in a very good place right now um, with, with, with our game. And don't get me wrong. We, we got issues. We got, everybody has issues, um, but we're in a good, good place right now of where we should be with the people that are leading our group. And, you know, it's just been something that I've been kind of just watching and, and being a part of it. And, and it's exciting to see just the, the, the uh, thoughts, um, uh, the intelligence, um, and really the selflessness that's that's sitting in that room. Yeah, that's been probably my favorite part of being on this side is getting to sit into that room because you feel like you have the pulse of the entire industry in that room. And uh, and you said it like people care, like they care about baseball. Like that that's been I get emotional in that room sometimes because like, OK, everybody cares here. Everybody's trying to do the right thing. And uh, just it makes you feel better about where we're at, without a doubt. And and uh, and it's not always like that in industries, yeah. you know, in business and organizations. And um, it's just it's it's I, I, it's it's really really good. Alan's speaking on the youth stage this year, so I'm I'm pumped about that. I mean, yeah, what has he I, meant to I you in the program? To mention, mention him. I mean, he he's been here since um, fall of 2007. Spring of 2008 was his first year here, and. Um, you know, he's been with me every year. My first five years, he wasn't here, but the last 16, 17 years now, whatever it is, he's been here. And um, I actually feel like he should be up there probably getting the award, not me. Um, and so 
you know, just I, I can't say enough about him. And I, I don't want to get emotional either, but but about him and, and what he means, um, you know, just to everything, my family. Um, just and you have to have that. I mean, you you have to have someone like that. Like you can't do it yourself. I think we've all tried no. to do it ourselves. Oh, no, no, no. You've got yeah, to have I mean, people if you want to have success. There's got to be people that are as invested in it and probably even more invested with the sacrifices that they have to make. Um, you know, obviously as a leader, you need those people around you that are going to be just as invested or in, more invested than you are in the program. Yeah. And, and he, he could be somewhere else. I mean, he, he he's had job opportunities and, and if people knew some of those job opportunities, they would probably say, Hey, he's crazy. He's still there. And, and, uh, uh, he believes in what we do and he's been here for the, from, from almost the beginning and, um, we're, we're nowhere where we're at today without him. And uh, I know, I know everybody says people are replaceable, but <laughs> there's some that are a lot, lot tougher to replace. And then I actually believe there's some that you can't replace. And I think he's one of those. Yeah. What about Roberto? Roberto's still helping? No, Roberto, Roberto, he got a job with the Cubs. So he's, he's with the Cubs now. He's, he's a hitting instructor with the, with their minor league team. And, um, you know, he's, been, he had, he's had two stints here and just tremendous individual and, I learned a lot from him and just where he had been. And, you know, he played for Coach Wells. and Coach Yeah, Wells, it's cool. Coach Wells is going in. You know, he told me it's going to be exciting. The, 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 the guy that gave him an opportunity to play Division I baseball at the University of Alabama is going to be there. And the guy that gave him his first college baseball coaching job is going to be there. So um, and he's one of those as well. And, you know, I could go – I'd go a long list of assistant coaches um, that have been through here and even our staff that we have today. I mean, just tremendous. And every time I have a coaching staff, I'm like, that's the best we ever had. And then I look back, I was going through rosters the other day of like 10, 12 years ago. And that, that, that staff was really, really good. And and even today, I think it's really, really good. But then I start to look like they're all re- they've been all really, really good with very selfless individuals that they you got to find individuals that they care more about the players careers than their own. And that's what we've had here, um, you know, through all these years. And I've been along for the ride because of that. Man, how much have you enjoyed using social media? I, you're very active just as far as putting quotes out. I mean, how much have you enjoyed that piece? Because I think yeah. you have a, a much broader reach yeah, doing I, I didn't, it that at way. At the start, it took me a while. And then I had individuals, I had players start to tell me, like, Coach, you need to start sharing some of that stuff you share with us. And, um, you know, and start, I'll have something come I What I usually do, I have something to come across my mind, and I'll type it up, and I'll leave it in my draft folder. Because I'll leave it there because I – I don't want to throw something out there real quick because I need I need to see if it makes sense the next day or or two or three or two weeks or a month from now. Does it still make the same sense to me today? Or was that just a circumstance that I was possibly going through at that time? Um, and and uh, and then I had a I was speaking last year up in Colorado and I had an older gentleman come up to me and um, in his 70s. And he said, Coach, you don't know this, but I appreciate you what you put out on on Twitter and some of those those sayings that you put out there right now, and I went, I had no idea. Like this individual was telling me, like, and then he's telling you, you need to do more of that. You need to do more of it. And I said, well, I got, I got you know, twenty four hours in a day, and and uh, I don't like to be on my phone that often um, if I don't have to be. I stick it in my Google Calendar. I still have like random thoughts and stuff that are just stuck. Um, mm-hmm. They just repeat daily. So I just have a lot of reminders, quotes, and and some I'll put out, but some I won't. But a lot of it's just for me. It's almost like a journal. Yeah. It's almost like keeping yeah. a running journal of, of what's going on at the time. I mean, do you have a favorite quote? I don't. Um, if, I, if I said one today, it would change tomorrow. Um, you know, I like to read. Um and it and has some thought provoking thoughts in my mind. And sometimes what I do read, I look at it and I go, that doesn't make any sense to me. Or I told our team yesterday, you know, we were talking about the mental side of the game. And, you know, I ask them, you know, I take them into the classroom in the month of November and and we go an hour each day in the month of November just in the classroom setting. And and we talk about life and we talk, we usually have a book that that's a part of, but we talk about a lot of stuff and and I asked him, like, who believes here that 50 percent of the game is at least half mental and every hand goes up? I said, well, so if you believe that you, you've heard this before, too. And um, then then what are you doing about the mental side? You'll go hit in the cage all day long. You go in the weight room you do all this physical stuff. But you're not picking up something and reading it to make you better. And, um, you know, I, I said over the Christmas holidays, every one of you guys should should go to Barnes and Noble, Books a Million or get on Amazon and find a book to read. 
And sometimes you're going to find a book to read that you're going to go through the first two chapters and say, this is garbage, you know, and throw it in the trash. And, and but there's other times you're going to pick up something and go, well, oh, that's, that's really, really good. And I needed that. And, um, and it's just a challenge that each, that's that process that you're building your house each and every day you're building your house and it's not outcome based. It's based on the process that you're trying to achieve. Ryan Holiday talks about that. Like if you start a book and you're not jiving with it, just put it down and try to find something else. I think people try to slog through books and like, it's mm-hmm. it, like you said, there's only 24 hours in the day. There's, so there's don't, that write don't waste your time on, about. on something that's not speaking to you. Yeah. Yeah. There's people that write books that they don't know what they're talking about too. So um, there's nothing wrong with throwing that thing in the garbage every once in a while. Who is the best player to come out of Eunice? Is Rafe Ray Rimes? Uh, I'm not even going to answer that. Question. <laughs> you know, I, I don't think that's fair. Um, <laughs> we've had a lot of good ones, um, you know, through the years, and and uh, you know, in 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 what what defines that? What defines the best player? I mean, is it what they did on the field, or what their team did, um, or who they are now? Um, and, and 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 so I don't. I get people ask me, who is the best team that ever played there? I'm not, like, not going to answer that. And uh, I've never even thought like that. I've never wanted to compare teams. And um, even I've never even thought, you know, who's the best player to come through here? I, I just I don't think it's fair to answer those things. And um, because I think there's been a lot of good ones. And and I want to define them of who they are. 20 years from when they I mean, played. How do you balance that with your current team? You've won seven national championships. Obviously you want to talk about the history and tradition of the program at times, but not get away from where you're at currently. Well, I don't, I don't think you have to, you know, you know, I don't, we don't ever talk about the history. We don't, we don't have to really, like the, the kids know it. Um, they wouldn't be here if they didn't. Um, they hear all that in a recruiting spill. Um, but after that, we're not talking about that. We're not talking of, cause I don't, I think it's a fleeting thought to define yourself based on, you know, what what people would deem success is. And, and, and what I mean by that is how much money's in your pocket or how much power you have or fame you have or or what a scoreboard says. I mean, we've all been a part of a game that we played very poorly and we won on the scoreboard. We're not happy. And then the competitiveness in us and the competitor that that we are, we we uh lose the game sometimes on the scoreboard, but we know we played really, really well in that. And I think it's a, doesn't mean it doesn't motivate us that we got to do more, but I just think it's a fleeting thing to tell anybody that their success is based on something on score. Or it's just like a hitter that hits a line drive down the left field line and it lands foul two inches, two inches away from hitting a double. And the the count was two, one when he did that. Now he's, it's two, two and he strikes out on the next pitch. So which is he? Is he a doubles artist or is he a strikeout, you know, just waiting to happen? And so which is it? And and I just don't think we define things like that. Um, and I think you free players up when you let them understand that we're not going to define what's on that score. We will define by how we showed up. We will be defined by our work ethic and what our attitude was and what our competitiveness was. Um, and if and if we're growing each and every day, we'll define ourselves by that. But but uh, not based on what's sitting on some scoreboard. And you're always bringing community leaders in to speak, former players. Mm-hmm. Are you kind of trying to schedule that out, or is that just kind of an organic thing that whoever shows up shows up to speak? No, yeah, I, I, I'll start. I'll start putting that schedule together in the summertime. And I used to. I usually like to have six weeks of that um, of guys coming in, and and it's no, they don't. They're free to talk for 20 minutes or two hours. I don't care. Um, and we do it every Monday in the fall. Um, and it's a practice day, but I don't care. All of a sudden we get out to practice and we only have 30 minutes left to do whatever we need to do, because I think it's more important for them to hear from people that they would look at as successful. And when they hear them and those people define their success as, as not what everybody thinks it is, it's about who they are as an individual, um, how they've done their job, not necessarily what their job title is. And, uh, you know, just tremendous stories from, from veterans, from, from, you know, high end, um, business owners who make a ton of money. Um, and they walk in with blue jeans on, on, and they've got the old car and you would never know, um, type of stuff because it hasn't changed who they are. Um, and just to hear them, it's always the same message. It's not the secret recipe. It's your attitude and your work ethic and, what you want to do about that. And uh, yeah, it's fun doing that because sometimes 
you know, well, their voice is different. I think it, I always <laughs> felt like it resonated with the players because they hear your voice every day. It's, it's great to hear somebody else's voice. And I think it's awesome to see now that we're now bringing in all these alumni that, that they, their pictures up as an all American or, or maybe not, maybe they didn't play any yet. They're, they're highly successful business wise. And here's the things that they learned here. And they get to say like, Hey, you think it's tough and you, you, there's a whole method behind the madness of what you're going through right now. With the landscape of Division One baseball right now, transfer portal, NIL, is it easier or harder getting guys to the next level now? You know, 20 well, round draft. I mean, there's a lot of things in play. College right baseball is a lot better today than it was before COVID hit. Um, I think COVID had a play in that because it backed up players, but also the draft going down to 20 rounds. That one year with five and then now at 20 rounds, there's just better players in college baseball which now trickles down to every single level from division one, division two, II, division three, NAI, junior college, all the levels there. Um, the game's just a lot better. And, and I do think it's taken away possibly some opportunities from some kids that's possibly weeded some of those guys out. Um, but again, I look at that and say, were they, they were going to be a part of a team. So they would have benefited from that, but maybe it was a time for them to move into a different industry or different, different organization to better themselves all career wise as well. When are you approaching like best fit for guys? You've been around. You've seen guys that have competed at the highest level and done well. When are you kind of laying that out for guys? Like, I feel like this might be the best fit for you. As far as what? As far as what? As far as the next level. Next level. Well, I'm honest with them. Um, I'm never going to tell one of our players, like, this is where you need to go. I mean, that's not my job to do that. Um, And they'll come in. uh, Coach, should I go here? I'm. Oh, whoa, hang on. I'm not going to tell you that. Cause you're not going to come back on me five years from now and say, say, Hey, coach said, no, we're going to let you make that decision. You need to sit down with your family. It's your career path that you want to do. Um, I don't, I don't think you should ever be pressured into a decision that you're going to make. And sometimes, and I get it. I mean, it's business and you're trying to get people to commit and things of that nature. Um, but, but you shouldn't do, you shouldn't make the decisions based on fear. You should be making decisions based on what you know, it's the right route to take. And, uh, Sometimes you got to be honest with the kid that, hey, that's that level is where you need to be at. But also mindful that you don't want to break the spirit that they start looking down because you want every player to believe he's the best player on your team. Um, and so those conversations, you you got to tread lightly and be very careful because you don't want them to think that any less of themselves. You want them to reach their full potential. Is and it better for them know. to wait and see and let the spring play out? Yeah. I mean, yeah. I mean, I, I'm. If a guy comes in and, and we've had uh, five guys that have signed Division One scholarships this fall, um, and we've had some guys that have had, I mean, I don't know, seven or eight more that had offers that they're going to wait. Um, and then some other guys that are some of the better players that were hurt this fall that are going to, they're going to see what's going to happen in the springtime as well. And um, you just, you, you have to trust your ability and you can't worry about what tomorrow holds because you're not guaranteed tomorrow. And I think, I tell those tell them all the time. You you don't know if you're you're worrying about this. You're worrying about the weekend. You're worrying about getting off of work. You're worrying about the vacation. You can't wait for the vacation. But there's people every day, every second that never get to them. They got off work, or they didn't get to the weekend, or they didn't get to, um, you know, the vacation, or or quit worrying about all that stuff. Be in the present. Be in the here and now. Enjoy the people that are around you. Um, enjoy the ride. Um, and and work your tail off and and see where the chips are going to fall. Yeah, we let the parents, you know, the last two years we've run these RBI clinics. And so the parents have done a good job. I announced in the beginning, I'm like, hey, stay out of the way. We'll allow you to come ask questions at the end. So that's worked out good. But it's amazing the questions that you get from parents now of fifth graders, sixth graders, seventh graders. They're asking about college and professional baseball. And I always have to be like, hey, y'all need to pump the brakes and this is what's wrong with where we're at right now for kids is we're forcing kids to worry about things out of their control too far down the road. And, and they're going to end up hating this whole experience because they're worrying about things that they shouldn't be worried about. Let's let's let them enjoy being a seventh grader right now. Let's let them enjoy all the things that they're into right now. Cultivate all those things they're into. It might not just be sports. It might be music. It might be theater. Cultivate all those things that they're into because there's no guarantees that that they're even going to play in high school. Yeah. And let's just call it what it is. It's a parent that's trying to live through the child. Vicariously through um, their kids. What it is. And and when those things start to happen, people need to start calling it out. You know, this is this is what's happening. 
you're living through this kid. You want the best for your child. Yes. You're living through them. Let, let's call this out. Slow down. Let your kid be a kid. Um, you don't need to do all that stuff. You know, you don't need to, you know, go play in the yard, you know, go on a vacation with your family, you know, and um, it's not life or death. And I mean, we're, we're running officials and umpires out of our game right now because of all the stuff. I mean, I'm talking to like our, our umpires, our assigners, and they're telling me there's not groups coming up. You know, what's going to happen then? I mean, you're already seeing it in high school football. They're having to play on Wednesday, Thursday nights more because they don't have enough officials to, to play on Friday night, moving games to Saturday. And, um, and, and we're weeding out those individuals. And at the end of the day, they enjoy officiating. They're not getting paid much. Guess what? They're going to miss calls. Um, they're human. Um, and that's what makes the games, you know, so good. And I've never believed in all this replay and all those things, because I think the human side of the game goes out of it in the umpires. And that's life that you're going to have to overcome a bad decision, a bad, uh, just, just something that happened that didn't go your way. Um, and it, and you shouldn't be able to say that's not fair because life's not fair. You should be able to overcome that. It's a great time to be official, by the way, because you're never not going to have work. Tim, <laughs> Tim does college. My brother does college uh, basketball games, and he's yeah. he's got a game every night. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it is. If you're a good one, you're going to get paid well now, and um, it's out there. But but who's going to take those those when when Tim retires and gets out of it? Yep. When's the next level coming? And I have a feeling they may not be coming. Yep, hopefully. We're trying to get it fixed. Yep. Is it more challenging coaching or being athletic director? I, I don't know. I mean, you, you look at it. I mean, both of them have challenges. Well, one, you're dealing with younger people more in a coaching sense with your assistant coaches. The other one that you're dealing with just head coaches. I do think an athletic director position is one of the most thankless jobs that's out there because, you know, either you, your coaches want more money or they want more resources. And that's understandable. Like I, I I would too, but also as administrator, you realize like you're trying to give them all that you have. And if you had more, you would give more to be able to do that. And so it's how to get them to understand that you're doing and giving as much as you possibly can um, through it. And so, I mean, there's challenges um, in both walks of life um, as well. I, I enjoy the coaching side of things because you deal with, the younger, the, the younger generations. And I think the younger generations keep you younger um, through that. And so um, I would, I love to coach, you know, and, and a lot of people just move into administration roles and things of that nature. That's not a thought process um, for me whatsoever. Cause I just love to deal with young people. Is the Bengal golf outing, is that your biggest fundraiser? Yeah, it, it is. Um, yeah. We, we started that and never knew kind of what would transpire with it. And, uh, Man, we, we've got a waiting list now to get in. And, um, you know, I think we had, I don't know. How many foursomes? Oh, we're full. 30, 37 teams play in the event. And we can't go. Everybody, you do a shotgun start with everybody? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So there's two teams on each hole. Um, and the top the top course in our state is the where we host this thing. And I think it's the 14th ranked course in the, in the country. So it's a incredible setup. It's in Kinder, Louisiana at the big casino. They do a tremendous job over there. Um, I mean, they host a U.S. junior national thing the week after. And, you know, Tiger was there last two weeks ago with his son, Caddy, and for him. And um, it's just a tremendous avenue. And and whole sponsors we've gotten, and we just try to renew those every year. That Those are $175 a piece. And I think we had a, I mean, $160, $170, whatever it was, um, 37 teams of foursomes out there. Um we got main sponsors of the event, 2500 Those are $2,500 spot. I think those seven or eight of them. Um, and then, you know, we get all this stuff given to us to give out to the golfers, from door prizes to uh, handouts of, of polos and golf balls. And um, it's just a food. I mean, it's unlimited drink, um, Coke, Powerade, beer. Um, there's three cooking stations on the course. They get breakfast. They get lunch. And it's turned into an event that everybody wants, once they play, they want to come back and then we get to raise the price each year. Um, and the be be best thing about good events, man, is people want to come back. They enjoy yeah. it. And that, that's the part, there. What, what I've tried to do is the people that play in the event, whatever they pay to play, I want to turn that back to them. And, and, and the handouts and the give me's that, that you, that they get. So they walk out there like, Whoa, look at the stuff I got. Um, and they want to come back next time, and then they continue to do that and over, which now will drive more sponsorships um, as well because, you know, you get all those people out there. I counted one time there was 
um, there's over a billion dollars sitting on that course with people that that their companies that were out there. And I'm like, whoa, that's that's a lot of money that's sitting out there. Now we hadn't gotten any of it, but 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 there's a lot of money that was sitting out there. What are some final thoughts before I let you go? Any other final shout outs? Well, I mean, just, you know, I think, you know, I've been lucky to have a bride next to me for all these years and been a, you know, and I could never do that without her and um, my two children as well. They're all in. They support what we're doing. Um, and in this coaching industry, you got to have people like that, um, that support um, because this coaching life and the coaching world and the amount of time you're spending with other people's children, which is usually more than the time that you spend with your own um, you better have somebody shoulder to shoulder with you with that. And um, without without her, I, there's no way I'm sitting here as well. So this is a team award. I know coaches always say that it's a team award. But but again, it, it really, really is. And um, just exciting to to talk with you about this a little bit today. Um, but again, um, it, this is about others, not not myself. Hey, with your own kids, I mean, how have you handled their sports journey? Great question. So, so I have a I have a rule with my assistant coaches and myself. We will not miss a game. Okay. Now, if if we're playing a game in the springtime, that's a little bit different. But if it's off, if it's in the fall and we got practice going on, um, and my daughter plays volleyball at five thirty, and we got practice, I'm 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 not going to be at our practice here. And if I find out one of my coaches, assistant coaches, is missing a game of one of their kids, um, that's when I get upset. Um, because that that should that's not showing what what a father should be and what they should do. Um, and we explain that to our players here that, hey, when we leave practice, we're not skipping out. And we always usually, hey, I got a volleyball game today. I'm 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 heading in to take a shower a little early, but I'm going to watch my, my seventh, eighth grader play volleyball today. Um, and that's what it should like, look like. And I equate it to the players. I said, what does it mean when your parents show up to watch you play? My kids are going to have the same benefit. I'm going to show up and watch them play that game. And our assistant coaches are going to have the ability to do that as well. And I think I think that that needs to go across all of our industry and all of our coaches need to start operating like that. Um, and if they would, their players would see what it really looks like to be a leader um, and what and, and, and you embody the leadership quality of being a father in that state, but also teaching them what it looks like to while you're doing it. All right, Jeff, have a great Thanksgiving, Christmas. I'll see you in Dallas. Uh, you're the best, man. Love you. Appreciate it. Love you too, man.